Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to CSDS. Uh, my name is Abhendra Sharan, and I'm a professor at CSDS. Uh, today evening, we have a very special anthropologist with us. Uh, it's rare to find someone who works on different parts of the world. And uh, our speaker this evening uh, has done research not only in South Asia, but also in Latin America. Uh, professor Kiran Asher teaches at the University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst. Uh, her research interests span a wide range of fields, uh, including feminist theory, post-colonial theory, development theory, and politics of environmental conservation. She's currently working on a monograph titled Fieldwork, Nature, Culture, and Gender in the Age of Climate Change, and her paper this evening is titled Engendering Environmental Justice Beyond Green Grandmothers and Divine Deities. Looking forward to your presentation, Professor Kirin. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you um, and good afternoon. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Mahesh for circulating my work in India and to CSDS and to Avadendra and Praveen for organizing um, my talk this afternoon. As I uh, told you, I'm trying, I'm gonna try and keep the talk to less than 40 minutes so that there's time for question and answers. So, um, so thank you again, and I'm going to jump in unless you would prefer for me to wait for a few minutes. I, I think we can, we can start. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna, uh, there'll be inevitable technological snafus, so I ask for your patience from the beginning. So here we go. Everybody can hear me, I'm assuming. All right. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump in. Uh, the first part of my talk I'm going to read, and then the second part, the recent work um, and my Columbia work, both of those, the first, uh, is recent, so I haven't written a lot of it. The Columbia work, I've written a lot of it, so I'm actually not going to read. Um, the first part I'm going to read, and I'm not an anthropologist, I'm actually a pedestrian social scientist of um, antidisciplinarian would perhaps be the best way to describe me. But here we go. Over a decade ago, in May 2010, hundreds of movement activists and a few dozen scholar academics gathered in Lima, Peru, for a conference entitled Encuentros de Saberes y Movimientos Entre las Crisis y Otros Mundos Posibles, which translates into an encounter of knowledge and movements between crises and other possible worlds. As the title suggests, the aim of the meeting was to discuss the various crises, economic, political, social, environmental, within which we find ourselves, and to envision alternative ways of doing, uh, of being in the world. The event was inaugurated and closed with a uh, series of mysticas, rituals or ceremonies, presided over by indigenous women to celebrate and honor the richness of nature and to highlight how humans are deeply connected to and depend on the Earth's bounty. Less than a year later, in um, March 2011, a ceremony equivalent to uh, the mysticas in Lima was part of the inauguration of a three-day workshop entitled, uh, on, uh, called Grandmother's University at Vandana Shiva's organic farm and training center. Um, since this is an Indian audience, I don't actually need to tell you where Deradun is or where or who Vandana Shiva is. Um, among the attendees were young students, mostly white uh, Eurasians, but also uh, Euro-Americans, sorry, but also some Latin Americans and many 30 to 40 somethings from the West and the Indian diaspora. Most of these attendees had come to learn organic and sustainable agricultural techniques from Garwali women. The speakers at the flower deck podium included Shiva um, and uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna. Again, this audience doesn't need introductions to, to Shiva or to Sundarlal Bahuguna, but my Western audiences usually do. And Margaret Alva, who was then governor of the state. The Garwali women, mothers, grandmothers, daughters, daughters-in-law, were at the edges of the crowd, barely visible behind the black-suited body, black, black bodyguards of Governor Alva. In their opening remarks, Shiva and Alva extolled the many virtues of grandmothers, including their traditional knowledges and wisdom, 
um, and the admonition to practice love and compassion. A decade after these events, the imperative to imagine a more just and livable world for humans and our non-human kin is more urgent than ever. Afro-descendant groups from Nicaragua to Brazil, indigenous groups from, from the Maya in Mexico to the Mapuche in Chile, continue to invoke concerns over nature and culture to assert their claims over their ancestral lands and livelihoods. And again, many of you must be also familiar with the vast range of scholarship uh, on settler colonialism that is emerging in, uh, from the United States, Canada, and also from Australia. What, as a Latin Americanist, what I find interesting is um, how this scholarship, which is not necessarily new, but really this scholarship does not draw on the very old and deep scholarship that, uh, and activism that emerges from Latin America on indigenous issues. But that's a side note and one that we can pick up later if there's interest. Shiva and scores of other activists and scholars continue to draw inspiration from the life-sustaining knowledge and work of rural communities, indigenous women, and other marginalized groups. In my talk today, I flag how the discussions about indigeneity, environment, and economics, what I call the three, connect, uh, the three E's, sort of as a short form to signal the connections between ecology, environment, and ethnicity, how they bear and uh, the, the discussions today are very uncannily similar to what was going on in the 1990s. So what I'm going to do is give a very quick trajectory of how these three connections appear in mainstream development discourse, and then give you a quick sense of sort of how alternatives to development are sort of uh, conceptualizing these. And then I'm gonna jump into sort of the more ethnographic part of my talk, giving an overview of the dynamics in Colombia from the 1990s when I started working there to 2019, which was the last time I went in to kind of give you an overview of what's going on. Um, of course, some of you may be familiar that the Colombian elections are going on or are going to be at the end of the month and Francia Marquez, who's an Afro-Colombian woman, is one of the presidential candidates. And again, I'm happy to field questions about that. I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, so I'll jump into my goals and contentions. There's too many on a slide, but the first two ones are the ones I'd like you to pay attention to. My contention is that we need to look at issues of gender, race, colonialism, and class as, con uh, as interconnected, um, and especially as very multiple and dynamic, and they kind of shape each other. We think of these categories as separate, and we need to heuristically, but on the ground, they really play out, and um, they really are deeply intertwined. Um, the other contention, and again, deeply related to the first, um, is the centrality in social reproduction or political economy of development. And again, I can't see who my audience is, but if it's an Indian audience, then many of the things that I'm saying don't need to be belabored the way I need to belabor them in the West. But again, I'm making the argument that these categories are deeply interconnected and that, um, that, they, uh, that, that social reproduction or the political economy of capitalism sort of they articulate that political economy. Um, and I will not use the term intersectionality. It's a term that I hate. And again, I'm happy to discuss why I hate the term. I tend to use the term differences within difference to think about the heterogeneity of social groups. Um, the last three points, um, the OHO means a warning to think about the conflations, the, the risks of conflating analytical and political categories. And what I mean by that will be clearer as I sort of give you a sense of what's going on in these two field sites, um, two uh, current field sites of mine. Um, very quickly, and I'm sorry, I'm going to talk really fast, but very quickly to give you a sense in the mainstream, you know, since the, the linkages between economy and environment have been going on for a long time, um, I'm going to flag them today from the 1980s, sort of the rough moment sort of, of my transition from being a biologist to a social scientist. And these connections sort of were very famously flagged in this definition of sustainable development that was put out in the, uh, in, uh, in the report called Our Common Future by the World Commission on Environment and Development, uh, which was a commission that was established to prepare for the 1992 UNCED. So um, economy environment connections sort of come up over there in the list of terms that I, and the list of conferences that I give, again, these are heuristics to give you a sense of how these, these ideas, the ideas of the interconnections of ecology and the environment are coming out in a variety of different places. Um, and again, a quick heuristic of how uh, rural peoples and the third world, uh, and third world women sort of show up in these development discourses. 
In the 1950s to the 70s, broadly speaking in the development discourse, rural communities and uh, women are thought about as sort of, you know, backward peoples, sort of underutilized labor in unproductive agricultural and um, uh, agricultural sectors as rural sectors um, and as welfare recipients. So they're sort of not thought of as, as folks who contribute to development. Although remember the previous point that I said that, that uh, social reproduction is actually deeply articulated in and by these communities. 1970s and 80s, and again, I repeat, these are heuristics. Um, 1970s to 80s, there's sort of a, a move to think about these communities, thanks to a lot of feminist scholarship that's coming out to say that these communities are not just unproductive, but and they don't, they don't just degrade the environment, but they are actually victims of underdevelopment to naturally draw on and know a lot about the, the natural environment on which they depend. Um, the discourse or the understanding of traditional knowledge again became popular then. I'm not making any claims of originality as in that these terms originated at this point, but they become popular in the development discourse at this time. 1990s, 2000, there's a neoliberal term is deeply established, especially by the 2000s. And so the language um, in the mainstream about how communities are refers to changes. And there's a focus of thinking about local communities as sustainable users and managers, or as resistors of economic globalization and proponents of alternatives, something that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and in the green development discourse, sort of thinking about communities as consumers and entrepreneurs of green development. Um, the 1990s, which is sort of when I deeply became involved with black social movements, um, the indigenous or ethnic terms was becoming consolidated. Um, deeply inspired by new social movements literature, especially from Latin America, although that too has a longer trajectory in other places. Um, the alternatives to development and post-development literature that was emerging, informed by post-colonial studies and critiques of Western modernity, uh, eco-feminist literatures. And then I'm sort of jumping forward that there's sort of a morphing and attention to the same kinds of ideas, or broadly speaking, same kind of ideas and same communities through uh, the political ontological term and decolonial term, which is associated with Latin America. And again, I, I think that's wrong. It's associated with the particular continent. And again, we can go into these debates. Um, I'm doing a review, not claiming that that's where it comes from, but just sort of giving heuristics to, to kind of pin where these moments come from. Um, and I'm flagging a couple of other terms that may be familiar to, to my audience, the notion of buen vivir or good life. Um, that comes from the Bolivian constitution, which at least legally accords rights to nature. So very quickly, a sense of where the ethnic terms come in. I'm not gonna read this very quickly where mainstream feminism um, takes issues of gender into development. And I'm going to flag mainstream feminism from, from sort of feminist theory and feminist critiques. That's also looking at these issues, but um, and mainstream feminism draws from, from let's call it crit critical feminism, um, but one set of folks are sort of very much invested in the institutionalization for good reasons of women and gender concerns. Others are looking at it from a very different perspective. And I'm gonna come back to the slide and these ideas at the end of my talk. I just wanted to give a very quick trajectory of how these terms, these three E's as I call it, um, are showing up in gender, uh, are showing up in the development and environment literature. And again, as you see, I'm kind of using the term environment and development um, interchangeably for the moment, right? Just to um, this whole notion of the linkages of these two in sustainable development uh, is a way for me to say, okay, in mainstream, mainstream development draws attention to the environment and I'm using these terms together. And again, we can quibble, rightly so, um, in the Q&A. So I'm gonna jump into the work that I did. I started doing field work in Colombia in the 1990s, again, through a series of co co uh, coincidences, which have taken me to sort of a long-term and uh, I guess lifelong uh, love affair and commitment with Colombia. Um, for those of you who may not know it, uh, that's an entire map of Colombia. It's north of Peru and uh, Ecuador and Brazil. Um, the part that I worked in is on the, uh, along the Pacific lowlands, the green part that you see, it's an old map, but that part of uh, the country is still very green. It's extremely biodiverse. Um, old map, but these figures still work. The most biodiverse, city, most biodiverse part is also overlapping with the poorest part 
in terms of um, in terms of human development as well as economic development. The green part in the middle is Valle del Cauca. There are four states that are associated with the Pacific lowlands. The green part is Valle del Cauca, which is the the um, sort of home of the sugarcane industry, and therefore it looks slightly different from the from the northern states. And again, we can talk about these in details. Right now, I just sort of want to jump into the movements. In the 1990s, in the Pacific lowlands of Colombia and all across the country, what was going on was uh, in 1991, the Columbia, uh, Colombia adopted a new constitution. It wasn't unusual in that sense. Lots of Latin American countries in the 1980s and 1990s had adopted new constitution. Colombia was not an exception. In the constitution was uh, a small article. It wasn't a law then. It was an article that accorded black communities along the Pacific coast, the rights to own lands collectively and recognize them as an ethnic minority. Well, um, that article turned into law through a series of, of very intense social organizing, which I got, again, de facto, I got involved in uh, from 1992 to 1993. And in 1993, Law 70 was, uh, was passed, which was formally recognizing black communities as a separate ethnic group and according them, um, particular development and especially collective land rights. What was odd about that moment is that, uh, and about that constitution is at the same time that it's talking about collective land rights and ethnic rights for black communities, there's mainstream, uh, like across the world, there's massive economic opening. Uh, and sorry, I forgot to translate that word. Apertura, economic base, apertura economica means economic opening or neoliberal globalization that's going on in a variety of different places. In the Pacific lowlands, there was a plan that said Plan Pacifico, and basically it's just sort of a blueprint, a standard neoliberal blueprint of privatization, uh, decentralization, um, removing of social welfare policies, removal of the state, which is a little bit ironic in Colombia because the state was actually very largely absent from these marginal places. But um, one of the things that I note, one of the things that I note in my book and I find is that in the name of decentralization, the state ends up actually having a very strong presence in the Pacific lowlands. Um, and I'll juxtapose it with what's going on in Kutch or what's been going on in Kutch in 2001. And amongst the many parallels are in the name of decentralization and neoliberal globalization, the role of the state and how the state becomes an extremely important presence in these so-called marginal places. Um, the last thing, and again, I forgot to translate, is uh, the Bio-Pacific Project, which is a very, very large UN-funded and World Bank-funded biodiversity conservation project. Um, the group that I work with, which many of you must have heard of, is the Proceso de Comunidades Negras, which was spearheading the Black movement in the northern, um, in, sorry, in the, the southwestern part of Colombia. Uh, its claims very uh, broadly were not just to get legal rights, but to claim autonomous control over the Pacific lowlands under the slogan of identity, territory, and autonomy, saying that blackness is sort of a specific, uh, specific and different uh, Colombian identity, that, that uh, black communities have been inhabiting the lowlands since at least 500 years since they were brought there as slaves. And so what they were asking to do was to establish autonomous territorial control over the whole swath of the Pacific. Because the green area on the left side of the map that I showed you, um, the green area that had sort of, you know, with, uh, which overlapped with the red of underdevelopment. Um, so the 1990s, what was going on is sort of the unfolding of these three E's in Colombia. And the very, very, very strong presence also of women's groups that usually does not get a lot of attention, but women's groups and women's movements were very active in the Pacific Lowlands for a long period of time. Um, and again, we, I'm happy to talk about this in, in detail. Um, I get lost if I talk about it too much because I've been working in the area for, a so, for, for so long. So, so, so forgive me, I'm going very quickly, but once I start talking about it, I kind of go in too much detail. So three E's going on, economic development, struggle for ethnic rights and environmental conservation in very big ways and a very, very, very strong and active presence of women and gender movements, often not acknowledged. So this is 1990s. Um, a few quick slides of my field work from 1995 when I spent uh, my most substantial period of time, continuous time in the Pacific Lowlands. By 1999, um, the forces of neoliberal globalization had done their work. The form that they took in Colombia 
was uh, of bringing in violence. And violence is a recurring theme in Colombian politics. The Pacific Lowlands did not have the kind of endemic violence that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But 1999, pretty much around the same time that the first legal uh, titles were handed over to groups, there was a large influx of armed groups in the region and massive influx, uh, and massive displacement of the communities from 1998 onwards. Um, but between 1999 and uh, 2015, or let's say 2019, over 4 million, these are official figures, for, so you can imagine that the unofficial figures are much higher, but there was massive displacement of communities, indigenous and black communities from the Pacific Lowlands um, with the influx of armed groups. And again, a variety of different armed groups, paramilitary groups, guerrilla groups, state, uh, you know, state armed groups. And again, in Colombia, the distinction between who belongs to what armed group is very hard to make. Um, Along with the arrival of armed groups, there's massive deforestation that goes on. Some of it is sanctioned because in the name of uh, removing uh, illegal drugs, there's a lot of indiscriminate, uh, indiscrimination, indiscriminate fumigation. Um, and then the areas that are emptied out of people and of plants, if you will, are planted with massive African oil palms. And during the, the Uribe regime, uh, replacing these areas with African oil palms was a national strategy. It was something that the government uh, very strongly endorsed that said that these are backward areas and the way to make them productive, the way to bring them into development, the way to bring them into national modernity was through African oil palms. Um, in the context of this organizing, in the, sorry, in the context of this violence, black organizing changes. Um, the new slogan, instead of just identity, territory, and autonomy, becomes identity, territory, dignity, and life. The focus on life is important just because there's so much massive killing. There really is sort of an attempt to erase those communities from the landscape. So in addition to a focus on paying attention to issues of um, displaced Afro-Colombians, there's a strong emphasis on sort of actually drawing attention to sort of, you know, what... Um, what many of you may know through, uh, 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 many of you may know as sort of necropolitics. So attention to sort of life politics as opposed to the necropolitics of the state. Um, I also, you'll note the second point over there is electoral politics because the black social movements had very strongly kept away from electoral politics. Their, their goal was to have social movements that were arguing for autonomy for themselves and sort of a different kind of politics from the state. But in the context of the violence and in the context of the changes that were going on, um, the groups really had to start engaging with electoral politics. So much so that now, again, as I told you at the beginning of this talk, in the upcoming elections, Francia Marquez is the first black woman who is the, uh, who's standing for, for uh, vice president. And um, the presidential candidate is a left-wing um, left politician, again, well-known, in Colombia and I think across the world, popularly known as Petro. Um, the environmental focus shifts from focus on sort of, you know, mainstream biodiversity conservation to again, issues of food sovereignty and sort of a broader concern with biodiversity. Again, in the context of large scale deforestation and large scale African oil plant plantations, the area remains biodiverse, but again, the degree of deforestation is, um, is pretty intense. And of course that has enormous implications for issues um, of subsistence because communities used to depend on, on the forest for their foods. And of course they have these very, very complex uh, food systems in which their cultivation is, is very linked to, to wild areas. Um, the current conjuncture very quickly, um, and when I say current, I'm talking about sort of the last 10 years. And in the last two years, everything that I'm talking about has just, the contradictions have just become sharper and sharper. Um, so what used to be sort of the, the violent conflict that had come in has become chronic in the region. The actors have sort of been deeply embedded into the region. State and market forces are also now deeply, deeply, deeply entrenched in the region. And quite, you know, black communities have been arguing for autonomous development and autonomous control, precisely recognizing that what neoliberal development was going to bring is sort of a very extractive economy 
that in its wake brings precisely the kind of forces that are now present in the region and that the communities have been resisting. The displacement of Black and Indigenous communities remains pretty intense every day in my WhatsApp group. Um, and if any of you, and I imagine a lot of you are on alternative development listservs, you probably get news every day about the massive displacement of communities that happens from regions like this. Um, at the same time, what is happening is sort of an entrenchment of a particular kind of, of mainstream development uh, politics, if you will, both the state's politics and a particular kind of NGO politics. And um, in a few minutes, I'll talk about Kutch and what draws my attention is how broadly similar these areas are very, very different. And yet the dynamics that are going on in many ways are amazingly similar in terms of how there's an entrenchment of very mainstream kinds of development organizations and development discourses in the name of modernity and progress. The ethnic and environmental struggles get increasingly institutionalized. They were sort of very radical before. I'm not talking about Proyecto Bio Pacifico and the kind of organ, uh, kind of struggles that were, or the kind of programs that were um, funded by mainstream organizations, but along with those ethnic and environmental struggles that were happening from the grassroots, were becoming increasingly institutionalized precisely because of the entrenchment of um, institutional development that I just spoke about a minute ago. Um, and as one of my long-term inter uh, interlocutors uh, and colleague, Carlos Rosero says, that what has become with these movements and struggles is that they've become more projects than politics. And those of you that work in um, development or know mainstream development, you know that development projects are very, very, very institutionalized. Anybody who looks at a USAID log frame has a sense that its idea of development is very much embedding communities into, um, into capitalist accumulation would be the best way I can put it. Um, there's a new peace agenda that is linked to a bow. Again, these are the terms that I'm using in quotes are terms that are increasingly defining the politics of the region. I want you to sort of keep in mind the slides from a few, um, few slides ago where the language and the terms of politics and resistance was very, very different. So what's going on now, um, 30 years later, is very different from what was happening before. The kind of radical politics that was there before has not disappeared, but the way it's functioning is increasingly on the margins. Um, I'm gonna show you a series of very quick, uh, quick slides to give you a sense of what the region looks like now and in the past. Um, and very briefly, because um, I think I've already been about 25 minutes, so I'm going to quickly go through. I want to get to Kutch and uh, show you, uh, uh, give you a quick overview of uh, women's organizing right now in the context of these broad changes that I've been talking about. So part of the work that I do, I don't, I can't go back to all the places as regularly as I would like, because again, precisely because of the violence and displacement that I've been talking about. But my methodology has de facto become sort of a long-term methodology is that I go back whenever it is that I can. And the field set that I'm gonna talk about is one that I visited precisely 20 years ago. And then 2019, I was able to go back and go and work with the same communities and just to see what they were trying to do in the context of these massive, um, massive forces of chronic violence. Um, and here's a, a very quotidian and graphic example of chronic violence. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I, I forget to translate these things. This is a poster basically advertising folks to say you can actually become, it's a good career to become sort of a paid cop. Um, and this is a poster, the posters like these are pretty common. This is outside of the church that says it's open, it's open admission to take classes to become um, to become uh, a cop and SWAT at least you can recognize and the rest of the picture even though it's not translated you have a sense of what it's trying to say so this is outside of the church in a very very remote part of um, uh, of southwestern Colombia at the same time about three blocks down is this wonderful also you know same things uh, sorry very similar things going on in the same area Rios Unidos or United Rivers it says, uh, Empresa Comunitarias Mujeres Rurales de Guapi. 
It's a community enterprise of the rural women of Guapi. Guapi is sort of this little town urban center um, and communities live not in urban areas, but sort of in very, very dispersed communities all along the river. Um, and I'll show you photographs in a few minutes. And this is important because in the context of displacement, going back and working in these communities is really a radical form of activism. So in the next few slides, you'll see a series of photographs of women's enterprises. And this is truly radical work because these women are trying to do farming and community enterprises um, in areas that are always subject to fumigation. Fumigation is now technically stopped, but the two-year project of um, growing chickens, that are chickens in the background, um, and uh, I had a few other slides which I think I've removed, and growing local crops or recuperating local crops was two years work was instantly erased because some government official decided that that was the area that needed to be fumigated. And so there was aerial fumigation and all the work that they had to, to done for two years to recuperate their crops disappeared. Um, so when Juana and I went back in 2019, um, they had just started doing their project all over again. Um, so I'm just gonna just give you a sense of what those projects look like. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs because I love dogs. Um, and so when communities go from point A to B, of course, dogs go with them. Um, these one part of the social enterprise was making medicinal, uh, medicinal, local medicinal herbs. So they had these uh, beautiful gardens and beautiful plants. This is clearly aloe that is used um, to make different kinds of herbs. This is the kitchen in which they make uh, medicinal plants. Um, they have, uh, I'm, now, I'm now losing track of my English, they make jams and jellies. Um, there's a huge project to make coconut, organic coconut oil that they use uh, within the communities for cooking, but also to sell in Bogota. So this is the community where this work was going on. I'm bringing this up to say, remember that I'd said in the 1990s, women's group were extremely active. They continue to be active right now. And they call this ethnic organizing. And in the women's parlance, the ways to work for the ethnic identity is through economic activism. Um, I'm bringing up issues of economic activism because in the prior discourse, what I started with, there is a very blunt binary between alternatives to development and indigenous development, which seems to say, that communities that are for development or for indigeneity do not engage with the mainstream. Um, and part of what I'm arguing, and I'll go uh, talk about this again in the last part of my talk, that this binary of saying that indigenous knowledge is going to save us from development and sort of considering these two categories as unlinked or oppositional does not really do justice to the kind of dynamics that are going on on the ground. Now, given that for the past 10 minutes, I have also been extremely critical of neoliberal development, you recognize that I'm not making an argument for mainstream development. The argument I am making is that the connections between the alternatives, alternatives forms of development and mainstream development are very intertwined in very complicated kinds of ways. And to think about the violence of mainstream development, we need to go beyond these binaries. So, now we're gonna make an abrupt jump from the Pacific lowlands of Colombia to the, um, the Western part of India, uh, the Western part of Gujarat, which I always knew as Kutch, and I call it traditional knowledge beyond green grandmother's lessons from a return home. I say home because I'm a Kutchi. Uh, I'd never lived there, but that's where my family is from. And I had been trying to do field work in India for a long time, and I was sort of looking for areas that are similar to in terms of dynamics to what was going on in Colombia. And there are many such regions, but I found that I could not really understand the nuances of what was going on on the ground without the language. So I'd been to the Northeast. I was in uh, Southern India trying to do field work, but I don't speak the local languages. I speak a bunch of Indian languages, but um, the ones from the Northeast and uh, the South of India are not one of those. 
Kachi being my mother tongue, this field work ended up working out, or this ended up being field sites in ways that I had not imagined. So I'm gonna go through this much quicker than I went through the Colombian part with the hopes that uh, to this audience, this region and these dynamics might be more familiar. Um, so Kutch, Western India, semi-arid desert, considered wasteland because it's so dry. Like the Pacific lowlands, this region is also considered geographically isolated and economically margin marginalized. Um, the marginal communities over here, the ethnic others over here are the Muslim Malhadis, the pastoralists, who are mostly settled these days, who are also dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods. And they too became massive targets of neoliberal economic reforms, especially after the devastating earthquake in Kutch in 2001. Um, this, um, the ecological dynamics, which are closely linked to the economic dynamics, are closely tied to this particular plant, which is Prasopis juliflora, which was introduced to India in the 1960s. It's a native of the Caribbean, it's native of, of uh, um, my other home in Latin America and the Caribbean. But it uh, was planted here because it's a fast growing species and it took over many, many, many semi-arid regions of, um, of the country. Took over so much so that it actually displaced the native vegetation. So the current ecological project in Kutch in this particular area is to see what it would take to remove Prosopis juliflora. Is it possible to remove it? What are the economic and ecological consequences and feasibilities of it? Um, I, if I had a little bit more time, I would read in detail something that I have recently published that sort of shows the contradictions of trying to remove Prosopis juliflora and what are some of the, the gendered absences in thinking about this. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly rather than reading it. Um, I do it through a series of slides. Here's Prosperous. The imaginary of Kutch that many people have, including my own co young cousins these days, is not from the stories that I heard from my grandparents or from my mother, but is Ranotsa. Um, and these particular kinds of imaginaries of Ran, which have no space for Malgadis and have no space for the kind of backwardness that is displaced in, or that is um, represented in the development discourse. So here are these communities that are romanticized in this particular ways, but their real livelihoods or their real traditions are considered problematic and have to be removed or changed to make them more productive citizens. Um, part of that productivity was a handicrafts, which is done by Malhari women. I'm showing this photograph because you're not allowed to photograph Maldari women's, but this work, this very detailed work, and especially the, the pink one is extremely fine embroidery that's been done by, by Mutwa women. And this kind of uh, emphasis on economic development and on women's, which is dependent on women's labor is very prevalent right now in Kutch. Um, in addition to handicrafts, the other main economic push that happened after the 2001 um, earthquake is a focus on milk production. Maldaris are pastoralists, they depend on cattle, uh, Kankarej cattle particularly. This is now recognized as a specific breed and the Bunny buffalo, which is also recognized as a special breed. After uh, the, the state's development plans focused on integrating Maldaris into national economy through the dairy, through the dairy industry. And the focus was to sort of really get them, um, to help them form cooperatives. And the implications has been, and again, I'm going through this very quickly, the implications has been that Maldaris now are increasingly having more buffaloes rather than cattle because buffalo milk is higher in milk fat and therefore has a higher market. Um, the gendered implications of this, which are deeply invisible, is that women do, most of the milking is largely done by women. And in the complicated dynamics of thinking about economic and ecological change, which is related to this particular, so, so let me go back, let me summarize. Handicraft industries, women's labor, um, milk production, women do the milking, and the formation uh, or, or, or the, the making of charcoal. It's technically illegal to make charcoal, but charcoal making, drawing on prosperous, is a very, very large economic activity, very important economic activity in um, in Bani. And um, charcoal is made by women, and it's also made uh, by the poorest and the most marginalized communities, or castes, 
within the Maldives. So I'm also bringing this up to talk about stratifications within ethnic groups. Um, so the focus is on thinking about the economic and economic dynamics of removing processes, but within those discussions, there isn't necessarily a focus on thinking about the heterogeneity of the communities and the implications of these changes for different elements within the communities. One, there is like with black communities, there's a focus on Maldaris and the traditional knowledge and an important focus. Again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about these communities as not being who they are, but within these communities, there's enormous heterogeneity and the focus of thinking about traditional knowledges of, I say green grandmothers, because again, that's a huge discourse of ecofeminism, does not pay attention to, or does not allow analytical and political attention to the intensely complicated intra-cultural dynamics within communities. Um, so I'm going to wind up this, uh, wind up the talk by, um, this is another photograph I wanted to show because my first field work in Kutch was in 2020. 2020. Um, again, to this audience, I don't need to explain what was going on in 2020. So it was within this context that I was doing field work with the Maldaris. And it was within this context that I was sort of relearning the complications of Indian politics and Indian social movements and how they were unfolding within the broader panorama of violence in India as well. Indian violence is not, or violence in India is not quite as well known or not known in the same register as India. But since this is a comparative project and I'm thinking about these dynamics in a comparative kind of way, I was sort of reflecting on how violence is both present and absence in these different places. What kind of violence is visible, what kind of violence is not, and what kind of implications it has. So to wrap up, I'm arguing that one wants to think about environmental justice, and I'm using this term very broadly. I haven't defined it, and I'm happy to talk about it. We need to go beyond the binaries to think about the complexities of power and differences within a transnational context. That transnational context is important. Forgive the typo and put this slide in the very last minute. Um, and we need to focus on the heterogeneity of groups to kind of go beyond the very romanticized versions of alternative knowledges. I'm bringing this up again. I don't know what are the, the uh, what are the, the uh, analytical ideas that are circulating here, but within the context within which I function in the United States, there's an enormous push to think about decoloniality and political ontology, and it sort of slips towards the romantic. I don't think that's the intent, but that often happens to be the effect and one that I'm strongly arguing against. And really, really important to, fo uh, to focus on the complex and very, very contradictory ways in which capitalism unfolds um, in these so-called marginal spaces. And here, I'd like you to pay attention to the women's groups that I was telling you about. Um, and I'm going to stop there. I know I've done a lot in a very short period of time, but I'm hoping that it will stimulate discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm gonna get out of this so I can see who's in the audience and read the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Asher. Uh, wonderful journey through Colombia, then a very brief journey through Kutch. Uh, all the three points that you put uh, in the last slide are extremely important to engage with uh, transnational uh, uh, power equations. Uh, difference within difference, that's something that you pointed out extremely well, something that all of us can learn in our work as we struggle with this kind of binaries of, uh, of, of describing groups and, 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 and people. And, and the last point that you made, the many contradictory ways in which capitalism unfolds, all, all three are very well illustrated, even though you, you kind of condense them into a few slides. Uh, I had two observations. Uh, uh, first, a request to all our listeners uh, and viewers, uh, you can put your questions in the Q and A box, and uh, we can. And Professor Asher can respond to them. Uh, I had two quick observations, uh, both drawing from this. Uh, first, around the method question. So one of the things that seems to me is happening as you presented your work is, in order to describe this complexity, you both take a moment in time, say the early 1990s, where many contradictory things are happening. So there's decentralized, official decentralization, but there's also community 
community action that is happening. There is uh, uh, neoliberalism unfolding. So a lot of very different things happening at the same time, uh, which each one has its own dynamics. But then you also do it over time so that it's not just at any one moment. And that movement was very interesting as to when you choose to focus at the dense account of a particular moment and then stretch it over time. And if you would like to say a bit more about how you do that in your own work. Uh, the second one is, is this thing that you came to towards when you're describing the end of the Colombian project, uh, which is uh, more project than, than politics. And I find it interesting to think about how you then frame women's economic activism, what you call economic activism, not as resilience, not as survival, but a form of activism, which seems to me partakes, certainly partakes a bit of this project logic. And, and so makes it far more complex than this politics versus projects thing. So if that's something that you might want to reflect a bit more on, uh, and then I'll just read out whatever questions comes our way. Thank you, I really appreciate those questions. Um, yeah. Um, I'm quiet because that's a struggle, right? Part of what I'm interested in against is to see the contradictions. I began this project in the 1990s when I was a graduate student and I had a very, very binary view. I went to Colombia to kind of look at um, indigenous ways of managing the commons. And uh, after long-term field work with sitting with the communities, all I saw, saw was, was contradictions that, that what I thought was um, you know, and again, with a very naive view, I thought about these communities as being outside of modernity and outside of capitalism, which, which was silly because they were brought there as slaves, as a way of sort of, you know, they were the constitutive outside of capitalism. Um, so over time, I see these contradictions, the same ones playing out in different kinds of ways. And also changing over time. How do I deal with it methodologically? I mean, the short answer is I struggle. And I also particularly struggle to, to do justice to the contradictions in a clear way without simplifying them. And I think that the second question that you asked, and thank you for asking it, helps to give the illustration. So, so the, the, the quote, more project than politics that Carlos was making was referring to, um, to sort of the broad politics of broad black politics or the black, uh, the broad politics of black struggles in Colombia at that particular moment because in the 1990s it was a very um, radical I want to say militant but both of these terms sort of you know there's so much baggage with them and I don't mean them in a narrow sense but the activism then was very different it was trying really to have a very different kind of politics which by the, by the late 1990s was clearly not possible. Um, mm -hmm. And the groups were also not openly, but also getting funding from folks like USAID because the nature of the violence and the nature of the politics had gotten so that sheer survival was not possible. So what Carlos was trying to say is that on the one hand, the kind of black politics that was, that was, being, that was being touted had become very institutionalized. Um, and the kind of politics, including the development politics that the state was trying to put forth was done through projects. And you could see there were humanitarian projects, every development organization or agency that you've ever heard of had, um, had offices in, in Colombia and in the Pacific lowlands, which was very different from the 1990s. And one of the reasons why I ended up working in Colombia was because it was a place where there were very, very few Westerners. And as, a, as in, um, uh, here, I, I'm basically trying to say that I was, you know, I'm, I'm a product of a particular kind of Cold War. I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s in India. So my notion of the Cold War and my notion of non-alignment is very linked to a particular notion of Western, uh, of Western organizations. So 1990s, there were hardly any Western organizations in the Pacific Lowlands. By 1999, every board you could think of was there. So that was part of what the project versus politics. 
The way it was playing out with women's movements is there was enormous tension between black mainstream social movements and women's movements because a lot of women's movements and a lot of women's groups were working with development organizations and getting funding from development organizations. So within the, the, the tensions of black movements, black movements were telling women's movements, y'all are diffusing black politics because you're working with the state. Um, and this particular group, Rios Unidos has been working for at least 10, I mean, at this point, 30 years in different kinds of iterations. Um, and one other term, I haven't written about it yet. I still haven't had time to sort of unpack what was going on. But the woman who catalyzes Rios Unidos, the expression that she used was, we are not against capitalism. Oh, sorry, we're not against profit. I beg your pardon. We're not against profit. We are against the accumulation of capital. Mm -hmm. This is me doing fieldwork. Two months later, I'm back in the States. I'm listening to Gayatri Spivak's lecture about Marx, where Marx is saying he's not against capital. He's for the social uses of capital. Mm -hmm. So to me, what's happening with these women's groups and what's happening on the ground has a lot to do with how they are articulating. And I use the word articulating sort of in its broad sense of what's going on with, with the politics of development. And I find that paying attention to local groups and their contradictions, that's where I find it to be a very rich place of engagement, but not a very easy pace of engagement of articulation. How do, I mean, I can't call them anti-development because they're not, nor can I call them pro-development because they're certainly not, you know, these, yeah. these are not UN groups. These are not groups that are, um, and you see this in small ways. Again, this piece is not out yet. I've been working on it for a while. Um, the women's groups shared with me the report that they gave to their donors. And the report was um, part of it, a large part of it was written in the form of poetry. So they're thanking the group. They're talking about, you know, they talk, and, and again, I'm not a humanities scholar. Mm -hmm. and I'm in the department, you know, I'm in a college of humanities, but I'm not trained as a humanities scholar. So to read that poetry, because they're talking about the groups, right? That it has, it doesn't have statistics per se, but it's talking about the number of bottles of jams that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so they're talking about development. They're talking about the goals. They're talking about the achievements. Um, they're thanking their donors, but a lot of it is done in poetry form. So I find those, those, uh, those aesthetic forms useful to think about resistance, but it does not, in my view, from what I have seen, it does not take the kind of forms that's articulated in political ontology or sort of, you know, eco, mainstream eco-feminist mm -hmm. Um All right, does that help? I hope that was a satisfactory Yeah, I, I would also love to see the daughters read that. <laughs> I have that to translate have... these things. I haven't translated so much. Yeah. But wonderful. No, that, that's something really, really important for all of us to think with about the contradictions as they articulate at the local level, because it's not one versus the other kind of binary. Uh, there's other question from uh, Aparna Sharma, which is she really enjoyed the talk, but why do you find intersectionality problematic? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I find the term intersectionality problematic for two reasons. Um, I'll come up with a third. I tend to be, I think, I tend to think in threes. But two, because the term intersectionality has, like a lot of other terms, has become extremely institutionalized. So instead of, you know, it's supposed to signal a variety of differences, right? That, that it's not just gender, that you have to think about other categories besides gender or besides women. But what has happened is that these categories the term intersectionality, and again, it comes within a particular context, right? Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is talking about it is in the American legal context. So to think about categories of race, gender, class in the legal context, thinks about these categories in very discrete kinds of ways. Well, on the ground, I find that it's hard to, to find those differences in these discrete ways. They kind of bleed into each other. And I'm interested in tracing those, those, um, those mixtures, right? So, so I want us to sort of not use the term intersectionality. Oh, well, that, that's a, let me back away from that. Let me edit that out. I want us to be attentive. 
attentive to the intent of what intersectionality is trying to do, but it's institutionalization leads, leads to sort of like this, you know, people say, my students end up saying gender, race, class, sexuality, it becomes sort of like this additive form. Um, and then doesn't allow us to do the kind of pausing of those interconnections that I've been flagging it. So that's why I find that term problematic. I also find the term problematic because, and, and here this is the reference to the transnational context. Um, the term has now become, again, sort of almost proper noun and attributed to Kimberly Crenshaw. The term may come from that, but the attention to these interconnections comes from a variety of different places and from a variety of different scholars and from a variety of different movements. Um, there was a lovely essay on Pakistani women's activism in Amrita Basu's edited volume about local women's activism. Um, and the author says, you know, we don't use the term intersectionality, but to pay attention to what's going on in Pakistani women's movements, you have to be attention, attentive to a range of different ways, including how religion plays out. So, so rather than using the term, um, I'm interested that we pay attention to the intent. Um, so again, I'm not, I'm not a purist in any form, so one can use the term and do what it does. Um, I prefer not to use the term. Okay, uh, Mahesh has a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is that land and forest rights as they begin to get articulated, uh, the South Asian experience is that they foreclose opportunities for women. So it's, is it something that you're su suggesting is similar that the language of rights uh, actually ends up foreclosing opportunities for some uh, in Colombia and Latin America more generally? Yes, it does. Although in the Colombian context, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different than the way it plays out uh, in Kutch because the gender dynamics and the class dynamics are very different. In the Kutch context, very much so because the way tradition is emerging in the context of, of uh, religious politics in India is that there is a Wahhabization of, a Wahhabization of Islam um, mm -hmm. in, in Kutch. And that is leading to the seclusion of women in the name of tradition, of a particular kind of tradition, which means that the kind of spaces that were, may have been previously occupied by women are now getting foreclosed in the name of, of gender. Um, and it's also playing out, and this was a talk I gave last week and something that I'm sort of trying to think about. Um, other part of my research, I'm interested in research on gender, but I'm also re very deeply interested in the gendered parts of research. Who has access and how? Who can talk to whom about what? And that is also playing out in, um, in Kutch and differently in Colombia, where access to women, researchers' access to women in the name of tradition is foreclosed or sort of mediated. And so that too, one can say, sort of has implications both for, for what women can, can access, right? There can be formal rights. Formal rights tend to be in the name of men. So then what happens to women? Um, and then again, culture, always plays out on the bodies of women. And so then culture could have a very contradictory effect of them mm -hmm. closing off certain people's access to cultural rights or certain kinds of cultural rights. In terms of labor, the very graphic example that I gave, women do um, a lot of the milking. I, had, um, I was attending a workshop in which two economists were presenting uh, a smartphone app um, that communities, local communities were using to sort of assess um, the different kinds of scenarios of removing precipice to assess um, ecological regeneration and then the implications for loss of income from precipice versus milk. Um, again, economic model, very mainstream economic model. So looking at very discrete variables. And of course, the variable that is not there is labor. Not that every mm -hmm. variable can have everything, but there's absolutely no there was no variable, there was no um, category for labor. So if you had 50 cows or 500 cows, the labor cost was considered constant. Of course, when you go and talk to women, the number of hours that they have to spend or how, how much earlier that they have to wake up to go milk the cows, for them, the implication is extremely material. Um, for the app, it becomes completely invisible. And it's a standard assumption, both Maltari men and Maltari men were saying this openly, 
economists in economics, it's sort of a, it's, it's an implicit assumption that if you're working at home, and this is why the term social reproduction, if one is working at home, one is not working. Our work at home is sort of infinitely flexible. Um, so that's another way in which one sees very uneven impacts um, on different communities. Yeah, I, I think it also, in part at least answers Mahesh's other questions as to what role, what impact does, do gender roles have on the assertion of the rights uh, paradigm? And yeah, so uh, if there are no other questions, uh, well, there is one more. Uh, uh, it, this is from Saroj Kumari, following from the question on problems of intersectionality, is it not also possible to see its usefulness in say exploring gender, tribe, colonialism in a frontier region with respect to Northeast India, considering that the experiences are really distinct? I, I think you answer that by saying that it's not, it's not as if you are kind of saying never, but it's the process or the, or the linkages that you're interested in and how you describe those linkages. Mm, I, I, see one... Pratama's question about, I see Pratama's question about language and that's true. Yes, yes, there is enormous. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, please go ahead. It Do you see any difference about... in the language of social and gender movements? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes and no. I mean, um, in the mainstream, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. What I see is uh, I have a slide somewhere um, on a talk that I gave called Lost in Application because there's a norm, right? As feminists, we are called upon to act and to use our knowledge, which I'm all for. But the application of feminist approaches when it's put in the development context, I see what I call a series of mad libs. But there is a lot of lip service, a lot of rhetorical attention to, to women, to empowerment, but very little attention to, to um, structural factors of inequities. And in fact, oftentimes the kind of um, the kind of work that is done in the name of gender empowerment, again, undermines the kind of things that social movements are, are trying to do, sort of referring to what Mahesh was talking about as well. Um, within the activists and radical scholar community, I think there's some really interesting possibilities that are emerging in the planetary context. And again, this is part of the work that I'm deeply interested in doing and part of uh, a chapter in my book where I'm thinking about planetarity in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, I think Avadindra mentioned that I'm a former biologist, I was trained as a biologist. So I'm doing a lot of this work because I'm really interested broadly in nature culture connections. So I'm sort of interested in what do these new nature culture connections mean for, uh, for climate change activism and the notion of planetarity here, how does one think about these issues sort of not in humanistic terms? Um, and again, it's a conundrum. I don't actually have an answer. One cannot think, you know, there's in animal studies and plant studies, there's this huge term of thinking from the animal, thinking from the plant. But really, you always you always access it from the human. Um, so you can't really think like how the plant thinks because I'm always thinking as a human. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that this focus on planetarity is opening analytically and politically a series of different conundrums that are very rich to unpack. In the institutional sense, it's vinegar and new bottles. It's not even old wine. Okay. Okay, let's take the last comment once again from Mahesh. And this is uh, uh, to do with biodiversity and whether wild animals find a place in the Jal jungle, jameen kind of land, forest, uh, uh, and water struggles. Uh, where is the place for wild animals in this imagination? Again, an absolutely fantastic question. Thank you, Mahesh. And really, this is what um, the work that I'm trying to do or would like to do in Kutch, sort of the long-term work that I'd like to do in Kutch that I'm interested in the gendered engagements with non-human nature, broadly speaking, that happens uh, in communities. When you talk, you know, um, in preliminary visits, you get, a, you get glimpses of what folks are talking about, but really to get an understanding of how this works, one needs to be, one needs to be staying there for a longer time. 
So I actually can't answer how that's playing out vis-a-vis -vis, uh, communities in the long term. It's very much there because folks are thinking about it. Uh, there's a, animals have not disappeared in all of these places. They, they, are, they are disappearing, but they haven't disappeared. Their, um, so local communities' relationships with their, with their environment is, is deep, complicated, but how much they're going to tell you as a researcher and when is, um, is something to pay attention to. So this is what I said, it's sort of I'm interested in. This too for me is a gendered element of research, right? When one goes in and I was thinking to give a very quotidian example, which addresses your question, Mahesh, but from a different, different angle. As I was talking to communities, I just realized that there's just sort of a, there's a script to the way I talk to them and the way they talk to me. You know, it's like, um, and so when one is playing out a script, what you hear from folks is sort of, again, very scripted. Um, so I'm interested in how does one access or go beyond scripts and that requires a level of intimacy, long-term intimacy. Um, an intimacy that I have better with Colombian communities because I've been working with same groups for a very, very long time. Um, I have what I call an ambiguous intimacy with Kutch because my family actually comes from an area just about a few kilometers from, from Bani. Um, and the Kutchi that I speak is very similar to Bani Kutchi. So there is an instant intimacy, but it has its limits, which does not allow me to access um, the kind of responses that you're asking for and which I deeply want. Well, thank you very much. Thank you also, Mahesh, for, for a wonderful observation that you put towards the end, which is on laboring practices, but also questions of knowledge uh, uh, that go together with those laboring practices. Well, it's been wonderful to, to have you over, uh, even virtually. There's so much to, for us to learn from your talk. And hopefully we should have a copy of your book as and when it comes out. Uh, we we'll look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you for hosting me. I really, really, really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Once I have to end it, yeah.